Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. In the previous module of this week, we have looked at the concept of digital writing and literary media. Today, we will look at new literary cultures and markets, digital marketing narratives, digital scholarship, and independent publishing in a post-digital world. Reading practices now, as we have discussed, have become more migratory in the sense that text can be accessed across different devices and platforms. This automatically dwindles with our attention span as well. We are now witnessing the emergence of a third generation of electronic literature that signals mainstream adoption of emerging forms. Elite creators now turn to existing platforms and mobile devices rather than building interfaces of their own. This brings a ready-made mass audience as it makes easier for users or readers to adapt skills that they already have, for example, swiping or rotating a screen on a smartphone. Our shifting reading practices in the digital age have also reshaped the society and the way the society communicates. McLuhan's statement, the medium is the message, has extended increasingly into our lives. The digital medium now itself changes our lives. The total pervasive effect that the digital medium has and the social changes it brings about also become the message. McLuhan had noted that the content of the medium is never the message because the content remains similar to the analog predecessors. The change comes from the new medium, which creates a new situation for human association and perceptions. What the digital age has accomplished above all else is to defamiliarize the act of reading. As we shift back and forth between print and digital mediums, reading becomes an increasingly self-conscious act. We study not only the words on the screen, but also the way that the medium itself shapes our reading. Digital mediums like ebooks can either enrich our reading experience or can easily break the spell of the narrative. Discussing a novel with an online reading community can transform the solitary experience of reading into a social one. The shift from printed to digital forms is changing reading in the digital age. Nicholas Carr, in his 2008 article, Is Google Making Us Stupid? and its ensuing debates give the most influential public account of the message of the digital medium. The article had initiated a debate amongst Nicholas Carr and his respondents, Clay Sharkey and Swain Burkitts. The discussion basically turned on three key topics. The question of attention and reading habits fostered by printed books and digital formats. The question of whether print fostered individual consciousness and electronic media privileged group consciousnesses. The question of whether the digital age, with its unrestricted access to texts and networks, is more democratic than the era of print. For the American writer, Clay Sharkey, the real thrust of the shift to digital textuality and the real cultural significance of the internet is its expansion of democracy. What this entails is that different kinds of reading are emerging in the digital age. Skimming, scanning, fragmenting, and juxtaposing texts happen online and it allows more flexibility. Amongst different information streams and a low threshold for boredom, one of the most significant aspects of literary digitization is the possibility of creating a library that contains digital copies of all literary text and that grants free and universal access to them. Major digital libraries include Project Gutenberg, JSTOR, Google Books, etc., among which Google Books perhaps is the most promising effort in the attempt to build a universal digital library. The Google Books project sought to digitize all printed books and making digital copies which would be instantly available to the reader. 
The culture clash with Google Books happened when it started commercializing content of the libraries. Instead of establishing a universal library which should be open to all, it sought complete monopoly of the books of the partnered libraries. Robert Danton, director of the Harvard University Library, from 2009 to 2015, published the article Google in the Future of Books. And he talked about how enterprises like Google Books stand in the way of democratization of knowledge. His argument was that digitization should not lead to privatization by subordinating public good for personal interests. Google Books remains for now in all its legal and ethical compromises as the closest thing we have to a universal library. As we have discussed in the previous modules, the shift to digital textility moves the author from the center of the text to its margins. Digital medium focuses on the links, associations and dispersions of meanings. A contemporary digital authorship that best demonstrates this is alternative literature or alt-lit. It designates a community, medium, style and a particular subject matter tied together by their extremely active use of social media. It is produced in a collaborative environment, posted online for free and edited based on feedback from readers. Existing in the free-flowing space of digital textuality, works of alternative literature are dismissive of conventional notions of original authorship. We can refer to alt-lit writer Tao Lin's novel Richard Yates, which begins with a cut and pasted chat log on Gmail chat. Malikello's Adrian Body is a detached account of a real-life sexual encounter replete with excerpts from emails and Tumblr blog posts. Many proponents of alt-lit see the movement as a way of harnessing the power of digital self-publishing to rescue literature from the hierarchical world of print and move it into the mainstream of contemporary online life. Digital production has not fully discredited the notion of original authorship. Instead, it has placed contemporary writers in a position where they must balance individual self-expression with the need to satisfy the reader's collective mind. Dash Show's graphic novel, Body World, is a product of this balance. It was first serialized on Show's website and revised for book publication in 2010. The artistic process in Body World functions as a complex hybrid of digital and analog methods that remain unresolved and in conflict. It is concerned with the digital present and more specifically with the world of digital publishing. It talks of a deranged researcher of hallucinogenic drugs and it takes as its subject the tension between individuality and the hive mind in the digital age and the fate of the individual artist in a networked society. If we look at the pictures, we will understand that each drawing is a mashup of pre-Photoshop coloring processes and Photoshop coloring. It has the smoothness of digital coloration with the roughness of analog brush strokes. The most distinctive visual element in it is the palimpsestic overlaying to portray the merging of consciousness affected by the drug. Through this hybrid of digital and analog, show expresses the unresolved ambivalence towards the digital world. Digital production may make the publishing process faster, more accessible, and more inclusive, but at the same time, it can never reinvent the print model. It can only improve on it. As we have seen in the previous modules, critics have argued that hypertext fiction would usher in a new literary era, which would perhaps be characterized by a democratic leveling of author and reader. However, it becomes important to understand that the remarkable rise of hypertext and hypertextual interactivity was also followed by a subsequent fall. Let us look further at this particular argument. 
The advent of hypertext marked fluidity and discontinuity of the digital narrative. It obviously favored plurality over definitive discourses and in a way freed the reader from the domination of the author. The two most important works in the early phase about it are 1991 publication of J. Bolter and the 1992 publication of George Lendo. In 2001, Lev Menovich in his book warns against how the hypertext refies or objectifies processes of psychological association that in traditional print narrative are left to the reader. Manovich warns against overly literal understandings of interactivity that equate it with physical interactions like pressing a button or choosing a link. Such an interactivity becomes deceptive in its claims to activate the reader. It would also be pertinent at this point to refer to Porter Ebert, who points out that hypertext invented neither non-linear structure nor readerly choice in determining the narrative path because the story that the readers discover as they navigate hypertextual pathways will always be linear. Reader response critics argue that hypertext choice cannot transform readers into co-authors because reading has always been an intrinsically creative activity. Let us take a compelling example of toned down 21st century hypertext. Stephen March's Lucy Hardin's Missing Period, published on the website of the Canadian general interest magazine called The Walrus in 2010. Lucy Hardin has often been portrayed as a choose your own adventure type of a novel for the generation that faces more difficult decisions of adulthood in the digital age. As the punning title implies, the text unfolds like a sentence without a period, lacking a definitive authorized ending. Marx shows the promise of second wave hypertext by not attempting to revolutionize storytelling, but using digital affordances to tell good stories better. It is an interactive novel, but the author retains his hierarchical position within the text because the choices that the reader once make cannot be undone later on. Lucy Hardin helps us to see hypertext for what it is, that is a narrative form that shares much in common with older forms, but whose subtle differences allow skilled writers to achieve artistic effects which were not possible perhaps in the print medium. What happens when the place where you are reading also becomes the stage for the story? How can your location shape and alter the story you are hearing? These were the purported aims behind the ambient literature project launched in London, Bristol and online in June 2016. Ambient literature project is a collaborative research which investigates the potential of situated literary experiences delivered by pervasive computing platforms which respond to the presence of a reader to tell stories. The reader is asked to physically seek out by walking types of location in their own environment and in response are given sounds and stories from remote yet related situations. Ambient literature experiments with how ubiquitous technologies found within smartphones can help us to access the data that is all around us to produce literary works. This experience becomes a situated and an embodied practice because the reader is staying open to the uncontrollable parts of real world and is also improvising as part of the narrative. Let us look at the ambient literature writing projects from writers James Etley, Kate Pullinger and Duncan Speakman. The Cartographer's Confession by James Etley combined fiction, non-fiction, imagined and real locations to create a story of migration, loss and betrayal. Breathe by Kate Pullinger tells the story of Flo who has the ability to hear ghosts. Using three APIs, weather, time and location, the story accesses data 
via the reader's phone in order to alter the story for every reader. Through carefully orchestrated experiences, writers draw readers' attention to distract aspects of the environment, highlighting the unseen and distracting from the familiar. Let us look at the example of Speakman's ambient literature. It must have been dark by then. It is a book in audio experiences that uses music, narration and field recordings from three places in the world experiencing rapid human and environmental changes. Must have been dark by then is a combination of an audio walk and a physical book. One of the things that's different about it from a normal audio walk is that there's no prescribed route. It uses geolocation, satellite positioning, but actually you're choosing the route yourself as you do it. You're hearing sounds and interviews and field recordings from three other countries. The piece invites you to choose different types of location in your own environment and at each of those locations you're invited to read a story from one of these other places in the physical book while you're hearing field recordings and atmosphere from those places. This is your current location. The circle marks a place. Some locations you will have to choose. Some will be chosen for you. And the work stores all those places you choose, so you kind of create your own personal map in the city, but then in the second half of the piece you can walk back through where the narratives continue and you hear new parts of those stories. How many real choices have you made on your walk so far? Maybe you've just followed familiar routes, or just drifted through this place. Right now, you should try to find some kind of junction Having Duncan make the first of our commissions really provided us with an opportunity to work with somebody who is incredibly experienced and that we can trust to challenge himself. It's a process of investigating how digital technology and smartphones in particular can impact on what we know to be situated storytelling and also how we write for that space and how we commission work and how readers respond to it. It Must Have Been Dark by then feels in many ways like documentary, but the particular mode in which it materialises, in which you experience of it, is different. This location might not seem important, but right now, it belongs to you. You are the only one who knows why you chose it, and now it exists as the edge of your map. The ambiguity that's built into the design of the work allows you to create an artwork that's unique to you. The three places are Swamp Plains of Louisiana, Empty Lativian Villages and the edge of the Tunisian Sahara. The piece requires the readers to switch between a smartphone and a book. They are asked to walk, marking specific moments of connection on the phone's screen and creating a map of it. However, the readers must also be aware about the politics of ambient literature, its future potential and the issues that it already raises. It shows the ongoing realities of contemporary, creative as well as critical works that rely on digital technologies and new kinds of interactions. Ambient works and digital writings demand an understanding and manipulation of technologies which have become exclusional. The requirement of digital devices also raises the question of who is assumed to have access to these means of interaction. It is predicated on a technological apparatus which is part of an emerging specialized digital culture. This excludes the vulnerable and the majority population of the informal economies too. 
The presumed urban safety that it demands implicitly creates an ideal reader who is cis male, straight, presenting, able bodied, and neurotypical. This shows that bodies and their reception in places are not the same for all subjects. Being male and white, they are unlikely to be interrupted or assaulted or to be seen as doing something wrong. Digital literary experiments and digital media's role in fashioning 21st century literature have forged the relationship between digital communication technologies and contemporary literary culture. There has been a socio-cultural conceptualization of the digital literature interface that is both contextual and contemporary in outlook. The literature that we have discussed can only be understood through digital platforms because they presuppose reading in digital environments. But the contemporary digital sphere is not just that. It is also predominantly about authorial careers, publisher prospects, and public understanding of literature. It is also about critical judgments and reader response. Let us have a better understanding of these components of the digital literary sphere as we look at it today. So, when we look at the digital literary sphere, what do we see around us? We have literary authors who have embraced an interactive and distributed model of managing their presence online through Twitter messages, YouTube channels, and different other media platforms. Contemporary book publishers have also expanded into the phase of author-reader encounter. Cultural consumption is evident through book retailing websites like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, etc. Digital literary sphere has also created the rhetoric of reader selfhood and individuality as well as cultural self-fashioning. It allows readers to catalog their book collections, connect with those of similar tastes, rate and discuss particular titles. In the digital sphere, the author's role extends far beyond providing the content. They are engaged in real-time conversations with their readers, providing updates on the progress of writing projects and selectively endorsing their work. For example, popular author John Green has his YouTube channel Vlog Brothers, and he even asked his audience to design the paperback cover of his novel An Abundance of Catherines. The authorial persona are increasingly projected via digital media and the authorial performance is made possible by digital media technologies. Authors have embodied performances at writers' festivals, their political engagements, and their continuing hermeneutic agency in popular culture. The digital literary sphere amplifies a social, economic, and institutional consensus. They also foster an author-reader parasocial pseudo-intimacy to show an unmediated authorial voice in interaction. At this point, it is interesting to refer to Baudu's concept of cultural capital and marketable commodities. Authors become cultural capital because they contribute to the intellectual discourse of the society and some of their works become part of the literary canon of high artistic value. They also become marketable commodities because the assets they produce in the form of books have direct economic value in the marketplace. The Canadian author Margaret Atwood is perhaps one of the most digital savvy authors. She has used the long pen device to virtually sign copies of her books. She is also a participant of Twitter Fiction Festival and patron of community writing site Wattpad. Let us also look at the contemporary voice. We would listen to a video by a contemporary Indian writer, Priyamvada Kaur. Her comments about the cultural dynamism in the digital literary sphere and the creation of authorial identity across multiple communication channels are based on her experiences of publishing her book. In the contemporary digital landscape, 
social media has emerged as a powerful tool for authors to connect with their readers, amplify their reach, and promote their literary creations. With the right strategies, authors can leverage social media platforms to create a buzz around their books, engage with their audiences, and ultimately drive the sales. We will talk about the effective techniques for utilizing social media to promote a book, focusing on key platforms, content creation, engagement, timing, and success measurements. It is important to choose the right platforms. The first step in effectively using social media for book promotion is selecting the appropriate platforms. Different platforms cater to diverse demographics and content formats. Instagram and Pinterest are visually driven platforms suitable for showcasing book covers, author images, and visually appealing quotes. Facebook provides a more versatile space for discussions, live events, and sharing longer posts, as you might all be aware of. Twitter's brevity is perfect for concise updates and engaging with readers. Although it can pose a little bit of problems sometimes politically, as I have heard. Goodreads offers a dedicated space for book enthusiasts, fostering discussions and reviews. It allows users to catalog their book collections and connect with those of similar tastes. So there is a cultural self-fashioning taking place and there is a literary display to presumably like-minded audiences. We have to understand that all these social media platforms, especially Twitter and Tumblr, form the superstructure of today's literary world. Through the exchange of links, recommendations, news and contacts, there is a mass appeal for the category of authors as we can create lively interactions with our readers, thus creating an authorial identity across multiple communication channels. You might have seen the book trailer for my novel Vega, which was officially released by Blue Rose Publishers in the YouTube. It has become equally important for publishers to become digital savvy. This encourages further reader-author-publisher identification. If there is a guarantee of quality control in the readers' minds, we have already seen how authors in the digital era become representative of Baudu's symbolic and marketable capitals. But we cannot deny the fact that it is the digital literary sphere's mass accessibility and discoverability that generates this overall cultural dynamism. Therefore, we can say that authorship is just the text. It is also publicizing, marketing, and interacting with the actual readers. This corresponds to the concept of authorial identity performance. More information about author Priyam Gaur talking about new literary cultures and digital marketing are given in the reference section. However, using Twitter for one-way self-promotion is known as broadcasting within the Twitter verse. Digitally distributed spaces have helped to sell the book not only through commercial transaction but also through advertising and promotions. And this brings us to the question, what are the conditions of existence for literature in the 21st century? Algorithmic culture explains the rapidly expanding digital regime of cultural decision as they help in driving the prominence of authorial profile and book sales through user recommendations. Innovations in online book marketing include launching book trailers through online platforms and the phenomena of blog tools that include op-ed style pieces, writer interviews and live web chats. Some of the previous slides have hinted at the commodification of books on certain online platforms like Amazon. Let us look at the picture on the top right hand side of the slide. This picture shows Dan Tuck's representation of Amazon as a cheetah and the independent publishers as a wounded deer trying to evade the cheetah. Another paradigm of the digital literary sphere is the book review culture. Social media has rendered reviewing more democratically accessible and interactive. The internet has permitted readers to challenge facts, lines of arguments or assumptions. The characteristic tone of digital book review culture is personal, intimate, conversational and affective. 
This could also lead to trolling and abuse of contrary opinions often. The critic in an era of digitally accelerated cultural democratization concentrates on textual specifics, judges the importance of work and place them in hierarchies of value and considers how readers engage and approach them. It is often not possible to identify the identity of those who write online reviews. A review can be thoughtful, flippant or biased. Fiction remains the book sector that still cultivates the practice of long format, linear, immersive online reading in which emotional investment of the reader is avidly encouraged. Let us also briefly discuss online reading groups. Virtual book clubs facilitate semi-anonymity. Unless a reader chooses to represent or misrepresent them through personal disclosure, pseudonym or an avatar. And online forums are synchronous communication and unlimited space facilitate lengthy and reflective responses rather than on the spot replies. However, the disembodied nature of digital mediums raise issues about the site's cultivation of data for commercial purposes. The online book exchange come reading group book crossing facilitates the exchange of the same copy of a book that has passed through numerous prior readers. The video shows the launching teaser of Netflix book club where readers will hear about new books and films and exclusive access to each book's adaptation process. This shows how reading communities are most often commodified through apps like Netflix, Kindle, and Kobo based on a genre's popularity, demographic appeal, geographic uptake, and rate of book club adoption. Technological advances have never led to the decline in demand for literature. In today's world, we can never neither detach literature nor its authorial role from the digital realm. Let us listen to the views of Priyam Vadagor, the emerging Indian writer on this topic. Authors should actively interact with their followers by responding to comments, addressing queries and participating in discussions. Asking questions or initiating posts related to the book themes can encourage readers to share their thoughts and create a sense of community. Hosting Q&A sessions or live author chats provides a direct channel for engaging with the fans in real time. As you might have seen in a lot of movie stars, they use Twitter, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram for live chatting with all their fans situated all across the globe. Additionally, collaboration with book clubs or bloggers can widen the reach and encourage in-depth discussions. In the digital frontier, everyone's a critic. We are looking at a boom of electronic magazines. Emerging of new electronic publishers is springing up of organizations to develop online readership and bring them into contact with the new writers. This is what encompasses the digital paratext. Digital paratext is a coinage by Simone Murray in her book, The Digital Literary Sphere, published in 2018. It is used to refer to all manifestations of literary interests and their existence in the digital environment. This includes the public performance of authorship through various authorial blogs, podcasts, Twitter messages, etc. The participatory culture of the readers are redefined through digital reviewing culture where readers review social cataloging profiles, lit blogs and booktuber videos bring in global literary conversations. Consumer-oriented view of literary culture finds its manifestation in online reading formations, publishers' websites and online businesses that cater to convert readers' reading enthusiasm into a commercially viable business. The digital literary landscape has evolved significantly in recent years with emerging technologies and innovative approaches to storytelling. Immersive experience, multimedia integration, non-linear narratives, and collaborative storytelling are 
all part of it. Similarly, digital publishing has transformed the way literature is produced, accessed and shared. Digital and technological platforms have redefined and expanded the digital literary sphere in terms of creation, circulation and consumption of texts. Beyond traditional ebooks, digital spaces have given rise to new formats like web serials, interactive fiction, and transmedia storytelling. The rise of digital platforms and self publishing tools has empowered authors to bypass traditional publishing houses and release their work independently. It allows data analytics for the collection of reader data providing insights into reading habits, preferences, and engagement levels. This information can be valuable for authors and publishers in tailoring their content and marketing strategies. In the next week, we will begin with an introduction to digital humanities. Thank you.